Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. I'm your host, Eddie Trask. This week's guest is Logan Jackson, who is, above all, just this phenomenal resource for homeschooling families. And we'll get into that later. But judacatholic.com is the place to go to learn more about everything that Logan does. But he reached out. I was just honored, honestly, that he reached out and wanted to have an opportunity to share his story. And that's what we do. So Logan, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to this. And I look forward to hearing your story. Thank you. I was raised Southern Baptist. Uh, my grandparents, my mom, most of my family um, is Southern Baptist. We're, I'm here in Georgia, so that's usually the predominant um, church here in the state of Georgia is, you know, Southern Baptist or Baptist per se. Um, but my life was, I guess, a little different um, in that, you know, I lost really kind of the only male figure to my life when I was young, my grandfather. He passed away when I was 14. Um, my mom, you know, I had a stepdad and he was there, but, you know, it was just kind of like he was working and my grandfather wasn't. He would retire because he was really sick. So I spent a lot of time with him. Um, my stepdad was great, um, you know, and he did what he could do, but obviously fathers have to work, you know, and so within that, you know, my grandfather was always there. Like I would go there after school, he would take me, he'd pick us up after school. So when he passed, he had, had a brain tumor when I was 12 um, and had to have surgery. Um, and finally, like I said, in May, I can remember the day it was actually March of 2000, I'm sorry, March of 1994. Um, when my mom came to school, we happened to have an outing of, or a field trip, and um, my mom met us there and let me know my grandfather passed away. And this actually, I think it's key to what happened next. Well, with that, I kind of acted out. So I went and adopted, because I wanted to be accepted, and I didn't feel accepted. So I kind of adopted an alternative lifestyle, meaning that I am, and I consider myself with SSA, with same-sex attraction. Uh, but went into what lifestyle full fledged at 15. Um, really, you know, a lot of people don't know this. It's going to be a shock to a lot of my friends, but I actually started dating at 15 another person within my community. You know, I was also called, you know, in high school, you know, kids could be mean at that age. So I was oh, yeah. called, you know, fag, queer, whatever, because I didn't date girls. I didn't have an interest. I mean, most of my friends were all females. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of like, and then at that age, you start thinking, well, if they're calling me that, then I must be that, right? I mean, I, I must be. If other people are seeing it, then that must be something that I don't see. So it really, thinking about it, when I started, that's when I started dating with it, when people started calling me that. I was like, okay, well, okay, well, people are going to call me that, you know, I guess I am. Um, and again, this was in 94. So this was before it was accepted as the normal. Sure. Um, you know, and so I go through high school, like I said, I, you know, day this off and on, but really my, my friends, I didn't really have a friend that I had well, my one best friend, which we're still friends today. We've been friends since we were kids, um, but didn't have any, most of my friends were females. So, you know, graduated there, went to college, uh, which was a very small community college in Alabama, um, was in, actually was in the um, choir there obviously, you know, had, had to do every stereotypical, you know, person is that. So I was actually the stage manager. Well, with that came being around these type of people because, and this is awful when I look back on it, but all I did was fun was on a Thursday night just to watch porn and drink. Yeah, that was, you know, um, and we did that every, you know, every Thursday night unless we had a show the next day. And then we were threatened with our lives if we didn't show up sober. Um, but so that went on and I left the school in 99, it was January 2099, um, where I actually then moved and went to the Art Institute of Atlanta, where I actually, my roommates, I, and I don't know how this happened, but every single month, one of my roommates, there were four of us, all of us were gay. So if you can imagine <laughs> four guys in the same apartment, shared a room, you would have, you know, there were guys coming in and out. So it was like, you know, and I think that's when I really started having friends. I hadn't had friends before then. So diving deep and meeting with them and having fun with them. Like I had, you know, th you know, we would, there'd be 
nothing to have 30 of us together on a Friday night. Um, just hanging out. And I really felt at that time really accepted. Um, you said you felt accepted. Is that what you said? Yeah, I finally yeah. felt acceptance, which, you know, it is. I mean, because it's kind of like now you want to find acceptance. And I think that's what is a lot of people, and I'll get to that later, but acceptance was key for me. And then I actually started dating my, one of my roommates. We just got close and we just started dating. Mm -hmm. um, and we were going to school. So in 2000, we decided to both quit school and just get our own place. So we did that. And we were together, you know, and that went on for, you know, probably a couple of years, three or four years. So we were together for three or four years. Um, and with that, I actually did a lot with pride. Like I helped a lot with youth pride. Um, and these were because it was, you know, youth pride is, well, it used to be 18 to 25. Okay. Now it's 15 to 25. They've lowered the number now. Um, now you mean to participate in any yeah. way? Okay. So you pride, basically what you would have within the Pride, and within the Pride Festival, you had Youth Pride, which were stuff for kids. Got it. For kids to do that, that acceptance where you would have speakers come and speak. You'd have, so they wouldn't really involve in the, the adult Pride because they would kind of try, try to keep them separate. Or that's how it used to be. Now it's all lumped together. Got it. Um, but yeah, so I did that, you know, for a while, but um, the person I was dating, uh, eventually we decided, you know, it wasn't going to work and he moved back to his home state and I just found another place to live. Well, I had been dealing with this because Christ had always been in my life. I had always been in the church and, anyway, and I think I did it and I tell people now that I was probably just rebelling and just telling God that I'm going to live my life no matter what he thought. Well, you know, still in, immersed in it. I had a roommate. Um, he happened to be gone. But I remember being, it was actually, I can tell you the date, it was December 30th, 2001, when I was at home by myself. And um, I'm sorry, let's backtrack, I apologize. I'm going to go back to, um, I, was at the, I was at Piedmont Park, which is here, which is one of the largest um, parks here in Georgia. And I was just walking, you know, I was having a bad day. I wasn't really feeling like myself. I was really depressed, really. And then all of a sudden I was walking and I saw a lady approaching me. She had, I tell her, she had crystal blue eyes. She had blonde, blondish hair, but she had it. She was wearing, she, was, she had it covered. She was wearing a covering. Um, didn't think of any, anything of it, but, you know, I said, hey, ma'am, how are you? And, you know, she acknowledged me. She looked at me. But when she looked at me, I felt a very inner peace. Um, and she just looked at me and said, I'm doing well. And just so you know, everything's going to be okay. I was like, okay. And just kept walking. Well, I walked about 10 paces. I turned around and she wasn't there. Like I had words in my journal and I was freaked out. Well, I was like, okay, I didn't think anything. I went home. So the next day, the next couple of days, I was at home. When all of a sudden I, I feel in my in my heart feel in my spirit the lord say i didn't create you for this and i'm like okay you know i don't think anything of it and i felt it again well, all of a sudden i'm actually am looking up so something came in into the house and i'm on the floor so all i could tell was the presence of god just came over me i said god if that's you like i literally get tears thinking about it yeah in chills <laughs> And I said, okay, Lord, if that is you, because that's the only thing that I, I was, like I said, literally was standing up straight when I, when I came, when I, when I, when I, was, I hit the floor. Um, but in my face was to the floor and I said, okay, Lord, if that's you, then I have to have a way out. And I said, I'm going to call my grandmother tomorrow and she's going to say that it's okay for me to come home. So basically I did a fleece and, you know, so I talked to my grandmother every day and probably from 2002, because she passed away every day, twice a day. Um, so I was just calling her that morning because we always called to say good morning and see how things were going. And I was like, I was thinking, thinking of that. I was eating breakfast. I said, well, I have to go. I got to do some stuff. I got to do some run some errands. And she goes, oh, wait, before you go, I've been thinking, I really could use some help here at the house. So, you know, if you need to, you can come back home and move back in, which is the exact same thing that I said that she needed to say. And I said, okay, you know, so that day I packed my stuff and I moved home. 
and this was and this was the day before I was supposed to have a huge event for Pride because we were doing a New Year's Eve party. So I moved home um, basically um, and was like, okay, then if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to need help. So with that, I can only say that it was God who, who called me out. And a lot of people say, well, you know, that's interesting. You know, you, do you, did you hear him audibly? I didn't hear him audibly. I just felt it. I, I didn't you know how you can kind of feel it in your spirit. Yep. Um, um, and the only thing I could think of that woman being now is the blessed mother because of how she looked and how she made me feel. Now, people can argue, but it, there was nobody around. It was just me. And I was just walking. Um, but I want to believe that it was her. Um, and I was still, again, Protestant. Um, so I moved home, started, you know, I was like, well, I need to find a church to go to. Well, sadly, and I product, you know, let me like, ask you this real quick. You said you were still Protestant. Were you attending church through these years? I would go every now and then. Okay. Um, not, mm, I wouldn't go, I guess, every Sunday, but there'd be times that I would just go, you know, maybe to a, a service, you know, if I, you know, if I like it, I would go, you know, I did go to, and this is part of it. I did go to, actually, there is a there's actually a gay church here and it's in larger cities and i forget what their uh metropolitan churches and are they affiliated with any They're larger not. denomination or it's just a it's just a uh, it actually with a um i believe the founder was a united methodist pastor but they're not affiliated with anything else got it it's got not it. like it is now it actually was yeah. you know you go into these churches and they have rainbow flags going down the sides I mean, oh i mean it's fully um like the ministers, you know, are gay or lesbian. Um, so it was really, so I went to there and I was like, okay, well, I'll just go there. Didn't really feel like it. So I started going back to, I uh, went to First Baptist Atlanta, which is Charles Stanley's church when I was okay. here, a large church. So I was like, oh, no, you know, I'll just kind of fit in. Uh, but I moved back to a very small town in West Georgia. And again, this is in the early 2000s. So again, you know, the LGBT community was still, very small and not really looked at like it is now. It was not accepted at all. You know, and I went back and I was just trying to get involved in my church. Um, but a lot of people knew my past and they couldn't see that I, they didn't see that I had changed because I still had the mannerisms. It had only been a couple of days. Um, so, you know, did that and just really felt hurt by that and burned by the church. Yeah. Um, I was like, you know, Lord, I know it's you, but I don't have anywhere to go. And this went on for, for years. Um, and during this whole time, I found, I don't know if you've ever heard of conversion therapy. Yes, but I, I don't know enough about okay, it. Okay, so I'm going to give you the, basically it's taking someone who is same-sex attraction from here to heterosexuality. Okay. Same thing change. That doesn't work, that doesn't work at all. That's like telling me, that's like telling you that you can change from loving your wife, to loving a guy, it's, you, you can't help who you attract me to. Um, but I kid you not, I had a pastor in this tell me that I should start watching straight porn. It's like, it's like, so you, and I'm like, so you couldn't get to straight. You want me to change one lustful thought for, for another lustful, lustful thought. I'm like, I don't really see how that, I'm like, I don't see how that works. He goes, well, it'll help you to change. I'm like, I don't think it will. I'm not really sure if you understand this issue, but just kind of ignored him because I was like, okay, he's just crazy. Um, and I told my therapist that he was just like, well, that's an idiot. And I was like, well, you know, because I was trying to seek both counseling and, you know, I was trying to get both sides. Um, sure. it. But it was really hard. I actually going through this conversion therapy with this person, really, I was so suicidal during this time. Like, a lot of people didn't know it. Like, I kept it to myself. But I just felt like, okay, well, Nobody really cares. Nobody, I mean, I just wanted to get closer to God. That's all I wanted. Um, you know, and so I was like, okay, well, let me start getting my mind off of it. So I started going back to school. Um, so I went to to your college here um, to, um, until 2004. So I went from 2003 to 2004 to a very small Baptist college here. Um, but then my uncle got really sick with cancer, I took some time off with my grandmother's brother. Um, and he was just my first diagnosed. So I did that just because I wanted to move home to be with family. And we had just lost her sister to cancer as well. Um, so I moved back home. And there I started going to Liberty University online. 
I don't know if you've ever heard of Liberty University. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Liberty University was founded by Dr. Jerry Falwell. He was he was the founder of the Moral Majority, um, and very outspoken on a number of issues. <laughs> and that's to say, that's to be mild about what he his words. But sure. you know, and people they're like they're like, well, you know, he doesn't like your kind. And I'm like, he doesn't like Christians. You know, because I didn't, I didn't identify myself as sure. that. Well, I, you know, I, and I still don't. People are like I'm still attract. I still have attractions, and I'll say that now. But I don't identify myself as that. I don't. I mean, because the the Lord tells me that I should identify myself as a Christian first and foremost, and I had that. Um, now I went to school there, and I thought it would be different. I thought I would have help. I thought I would do that. But again, I was told and basically said that I couldn't do anything. I couldn't be involved in leadership because of my past. Even though at this time I had been out since 2002 and not dated, not doing anything, and was uh, practically chased. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. It was like you're heading towards saying that you're fully chased. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, so, you know, so then that time I was like, you know what, I might as well just start. And I started acting out again just because, you know, I was like, okay, if they're not going to set me, then I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not going to keep pushing it. It's not, I mean, if I'm not going to have any help, and I'm doing this, but yet Christians are saying that it, I can't do it. You know, it, for me, it didn't make any sense. Um, so I started acting out, you know, there um, at Liberty. And I look back and I feel bad because I was going to a Christian school and I felt like it was a slap in the face of God again, you know, because he had called me out. Um, but it was my best friend who actually was Catholic. Um, he actually, we would go out and eat and he was actually the only person that showed love to me. One of the only people that showed love. He would he would buy he would go out for dinner. He didn't see me as anybody else, but, but Logan. He didn't see me. He, in my, he didn't see me as my struggle. He saw me as a person. And he kept saying, "You would be great as a priest." And I'm like, "Well, that would mean I'd have to be Catholic, and I'm not." Um, and this went on literally. This went on for years, like from 2008, <laughs> and I to you know to later on, but. Um, I graduated, he stayed on, and then he finally left because of how he got treated as a Catholic on campus. Because Liberty at the time didn't really like Catholics and actually taught a class on basically an anti-Catholic class. Okay. And I took the class, which actually- Helped you? It actually helped me, yes. Because it, it helped me do a lot more research. Because I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna research it. It doesn't make sense. So I started researching it. Well, I moved back home. I graduated from Liberty with my bachelor's degree. Um, I moved back home started my master's degree and started going, I didn't want to go to a Baptist church. So I went to, started going to a Presbyterian church. Well, I went to a PCUSA. And if anybody knows what PCUSA is, it's very liberal. They're the liberal side of the, um, I think one of the liberal sides of the uh, Presbyterian church. My minister was a female. I mean, I didn't have a problem because my cousins are assembly of God and they're both ministers. Okay. And females. So I was like, okay, whatever. I'm not going to, I'm not going to question, you know, whether you're recalled or not, I felt like, you know, if that's between you and God and he'll, you know, he has the final say. Well, what really got me is I went and told her my story and how I was struggling. And the only thing she could say was, and I quote, well, if you feel like you, if you start dating someone and you want to bring your boyfriend to church with you, that's fine. And I was like, were you even listening? No, she wasn't listening to me wanting the help to get out, the wanting to really pursue that and just to be single and leave, leave a chase life. Um, and I think it was later that year. So this would have been 2011 because I went through Liberty and stuff. So 2011, again, started working on my degree. And was 2000, so 2011, I started going there. 2012, I don't know if you remember, but the Presbyterian Church had their presbytery. They, they had the conference and they voted that year to allow for marriages, gay and lesbian marriages in the church. That is right i didn't realize that it was that year but i do know about that it was, yeah i would yeah it had to be is either that or 13 so sorry 2012 they brought it up and it was voted down but the next year they brought it up and it passed <clears throat> um but i was still questioning it then so this would have been um even when they brought it up i was still questioning it because they didn't want their pastors to be gay or lesbian or be married and my question was, is how can you tell a gay pastor that he can marry somebody, but they can't be married themselves? That to me didn't make sense. And I was like, well, so I remember flipping to the channel 
and run across the journey home. I love Marcus Grodi. So I started watching it. And then all of a sudden I called my best friend, his name is Clayton, he, he was Catholic. And he was like, and we talked for three hours about the church. I was like, I'm done. Tell me what I need to do about the Catholic church. Just start talking to me. And we like, literally, he kind of talked for me for that. So he sent me the book, Rome Sweet Home. I read it. I'm not, a, I'm not a really good, I'm not a really fast reader, but I read it in probably a week and a half, which I hate reading. But I, after that, I started loving it because it was just so what I was looking for and what I wanted. Um, and so that went me on and I was already late to come into the church in 13 uh, because this was in December. So 2014 was coming up. Uh, in four months, but I would go to some of the RCIA classes in my hometown. Well, that led me to apply for a job in Texas, and I got it. So I moved to Dallas, Texas in April. Um, and, you know, I was just like, okay, look, I'm just, since I'm looking at the Catholic church, I'm just going to find a Catholic church, you know, and try to attend. So the closest church to me was called St. Rita's, which was uh, 10 minutes, five minutes from where I lived. It was Easter Sunday. And I kid you not, the only place that was available was beside one woman. And she happened to be one of the directors for RCIA. And I was like, I introduced myself and said, I'm looking for the church. And she didn't say anything. And then she talked to me after church and she goes, can I get your phone number? I'm actually one of the directors for RCIA. And I was like, okay, cool. So we started that way, you know, kind of relationship. And then, so I joined RCIA in 2014 still was still struggling you know with with how I was treated in, in the Protestant church sure in question whether or not the Catholic church would accept me because I knew the teachings of the Catholic church and it was very I knew what it used to be it was very strong and the marriage the their thing with marriage was very was very strict it was very so I wasn't for sure how the Catholic church would react to someone who was still having the attractions um and you know but not really living them. Um, and, you know, so I went and, you know, I don't have any friends at this point. Again, you know, so when I left the loss, I left all my friends. So I haven't had friends to hang out with and or talk to in years. So I'm doing this all myself. It's just me and God. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, and it was fun because, you know, I'm, you know, I was kind of a loner anyway when high school and college. So I was like, okay, God, I mean, if I'm going to do it, then I, I mean, it's just going to be me and you and you're going to have to help me through the, throughout. But I will say that the Lord put a, a, a great friend of mine now, he's still in Texas, um, and I met him doing daily mass because I would actually just start going to daily mass. Uh, I hadn't started my job yet, so I was like, okay, well, I'll go to daily mass so I kind of get used to it. Because if anybody knows me, if I decide on something, I'm all in. I mean, I'm not going to go halfway. I'm not, they're like, you know, they're like, well, you should go to this Protestant church. I'm like, well, no, if I'm going to be Catholic, I'm going to start going to the Catholic church because I need to know how to pray, how to carry myself. But I love, I, I love, I love the liturgy. I love the music. For me, it was very peaceful and I felt at home. And it's funny because, and I would get caught a lot, but I would go in front of the, the Blessed Sacrament. We had several chapel and I would go in there and I'd actually fall asleep because my body, my spirit could rest. And I'd go in there and shut the door and I would just fall asleep. And the priest would, would not wake me up. He goes, yeah, I saw you there, but I would just let you sleep because, you know, you look like you were resting because he knew that what I was battling. Yeah. Um, so he would be like, okay, if you just need to come here, sometimes I would just go there, pray, but fall asleep while I was praying. And people are like, but you pray, you sit before Jesus. And I'm like, well, <laughs> and so I was like, so, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I was trying to watch, you know, and pray, but when you get into the, and I don't know if you, you, probably, you may know the feeling when you get into the, into that and you just have the Lord and your body just relaxes and you have that peace and you have, there's no worry. It's just you and yeah. Christ. Yeah. It's very peaceful. And I still find that today. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I started RCIA and loved it because we had a priest that did our RCIA. He would, you know, he actually is one of the, he was Anglican, but came into the Catholic church. His name is Father Josh. Love him. He was actually very instrumental in me coming into the church and helping me understand a lot of things um, regarding the same sense attraction and the church and things of that nature. And I'm very grateful for him. Um, and, but he, uh, he taught, he was Anglican. He was, he, he knew everything. Like he has a wife and I think four kids, five kids now. Um, 
And it was just interesting just to get to know him and have him teach it because he was very thorough. Yeah. I mean, he would leave nothing to chance. He would, you know, he would make sure that we knew everything that we were getting into. The good, the bad, the ugly, the great, you know, everything. Um, but he would tell you, you know, you know, sometimes you're going to, you know, not, we're not going to have great people in leadership, but we still have to, you know, keep our eye to Christ. Um, you know, and that kind of helped me. So, you know, it's coming along and then we're getting to confession. You know, we're doing the whole RCIA thing and having our first confession and all this. And I was like, uh, do you have three days? Because it may take me a while. Um, he's like, just do, he was like, just do the abridged version of hit to hot topics. And we did, did a couple of times and he was great. And it felt, I don't think people understand when you talk about products, they don't understand what confession does. It actually frees you because you're telling somebody and you're walking out and it's not on you anymore. And you're just like, okay, you know, and when I left, I had a huge relief. Um, but he did tell me, and not in the confession, but when we're meeting outside, that the biggest thing that I had to struggle with is my identity or my acceptance, you know, that, you know, when I came to the church that I had, I'd had to die to my old self. And he prepared me, he, you know, he goes, you know, he's like, I'm not, he's like, it's going to be different. I can tell you now, but it's going to be different when you come to the church. And so we worked on that. He would counsel me and help me. And it was great because I finally had somebody who was helping me to understand that I could live. He goes, but you can live. I mean, he goes, you can live chase. I mean, look at Paul, look, look at Peter, look at Jesus. They live the chase life. And I'm like, yeah, that's like, that's all I wanted. I, mean, I didn't feel the call to get married. Sure. I never felt the call to get married. Um, but yet I was, and I still to this day, I get told, well, Christ wants you to be with somebody. He wants you to be happy. I'm like, you know, but I'm like, I don't feel that. I don't, you know, I don't feel that call. And marriage is a calling. Marriage, you have to feel that call, you know, I feel. Um, so through that whole year, you know, it came to um, Easter Vigil, which was great. And the day, the day of, I talked to Father before, and I was like, so... I guess this is it. I guess once I'm confirmed and take, you know, the Eucharist for the first time, the old me is gone. And he was like, yes. And I literally, you know, and I, it didn't really hit me till later, but I literally think I mourned it, mourned, my, mourned the loss of myself, my old life for two weeks, three weeks. Like I was, when I came into the church, I came into the church um, April of 2015. Okay. But let me tell you how I found my patron. My patron is actually Pier Giorgio Frasati. <laughs> I actually chose, I had actually chosen, he chose me. I was actually going to use St. Gabriel because of a communications major and St. Gabriel would go in and do all the announcing. And I felt, okay, well, I can do that. Well, no, um, um, Pier Giorgio had a, another idea. So he, I feel like he chased me. And I say that because I didn't know who the person was. I had no idea. Somebody said, you should look into to Blessed Pure Giorgio. And I was like, okay, you know, look into him. Well, two days later, somebody said, have you thought of Pure Giorgio as your, as your patriot? I'm like, he's blessed, he's not a saint. And I said, they're like, well, sometimes they let you use a blessed. Well, and then, I actually turned on the TV on EWTN and they were talking about him. I'm like, okay, look, well, I get it. I mean, I understand. You want me to, but not only that, but that week, so in one week I heard his name and people tell me that seven times. And so it was one, once a day for a week, they said, have you thought of Pier Giorgio Versace? I hadn't, but then I read his book and I read and, you know, he, you know, and I call him not only my, my patient, but he also my big brother, because I think he's always with me. Like I, we talk pretty much daily. Um, and I believe it was him when I took the name, that, you know, I was allowed to do it. And the priest told me during confirmation to make sure I lean on Pier Giorgio Versace because he was a man's man and he would show me and he has you know but we have a we have a local uh knights of columbus council and we just named him as the patron over oh, wow. the council <laughs> it's <laughs> crazy actually, well that i actually founded a men's group and as actually i started a men's group i came in in april i started a men's group in may called 
the Versailles Fellowship. It was all guys. We met, we ate together, we prayed together every Monday. We would do this wow. every day. And we did it for over, well, I think they actually ended it last year. So it had been almost four years and most of them, are, now everybody's married. Um, now, you know, when I go back, I will tell you that I had so much spiritual warfare afterwards that it, it was underestimated. Like I literally felt sick. I was literally sick. I couldn't do anything. I was in the bed for like a week. You're saying, I'm sorry, post-confirmation? Post-confirmation. After, yes. So after you, after those few weeks where you said you were mourning the loss of your old self, yes. then so kind during, of- it was Actually kind of the, during the same time. Part of that, okay. Was, yeah, so during the morning situation, I was sick and felt really attacked because I had stopped doing what Satan wanted me to do. Yeah. I literally had said no. Um, and that went, you know, and, you know, and so that went on for a while. And I was like, literally couldn't go to some masses on Sundays because I literally could not get myself out of bed because I was just felt so oppressed at the time. Wow. And finally, you know, Father Josh was like, you have to get, you know, he gave me some prayers to do at night and in the day. And that really helped. Uh, I think it was uh, some prayers from the um, the Desert Fathers, um, which a lot of people say that the, that's what brought them in the church. But for me, it wasn't. Um, for me, it was more of a Christ thing. And I know I'm kind of backtracking. Um, but when people say, well, you know, I read myself in the church, I kind of read some books, but they weren't from church. They weren't from church fathers. Like I I, you know, was, you know, like, um, most of them were Scott Hahn's books, because I love how he wrote, and I'm, a, you know, I like theology, and he was very theological, and I can understand it, but a lot of it had to do with, can this church help me to be a, a God-centered person? Got it. And during right. this time, I um, also, you saw the Protestant churches going down. So as I was coming into the church, the Protestant churches were taking a nosedive. Um, you know, and even the, the Catholic church at that time had started doing some questionable things. But, you know, I was like, okay, well, if this is God's church, then obviously, you know, the church is not perfect because we have people in it. But Christ is, you know, first and foremost, the, um, the head of the church. Um, I had no problem with the Pope. I was like, okay, it is what it is. It's like, I'll get the Pope, like the, the, the president of Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, he didn't look any different than me. They're like, I mean, but they're like, well, he, you know, he, you know, he's infallible. I'm like, I don't see that. I don't, you know, and I'm like, um, no, I don't really see that. And any writings that I've read, I don't, pretty sure he seems, um, you know, so that was it. But when I came to the church, um, too, I lost a lot of family. Because most of my family are Baptist, and they were like, well, you know, the Catholic Church is not a, the true church. And I said, and I would ask them, well, you do realize that the Catholic Church was the only church until the um, 15th century. So I'm like, so for 1500 years, where did people go? So it had to be a church. Um, but how'd, really, they, how'd they respond to that? They didn't. They're like, well, you know. They didn't respond. They would just say, well, you know, but they were wrong. And, you know, I'm like, so, you you know, they were like, well, they were wrong. And it, it just meant universal. I'm like, well, it does. But it, I mean, I'm like, you know, you, just, you there's times when you just don't want to argue with them. You're just like, okay, yeah. I mean, because, you know, but so that year went on. I think, you know, that for me, it was all about, I think, so, so even now with the struggles, and then I lost a lot, like I said, a lot of people. Like I still don't have, I have maybe a handful of friends, you know, five or six. I don't have a lot of friends. And, you know, that, that's one thing that bothers me about the church is it's sometimes not relatable sometimes. Like, you know, like I still feel, while I am, while I am accepted as a chaste person, you still have people who will, you know, like I'm 42, I'm not married. I don't feel called to be married. I don't have any kids, but the people my age that I could talk to are usually married with kids. I mean, I don't care if you have kids. I don't care that you're married, but I feel like you hang out with those that you relate to. Sure. So you're wondering where, where, where are the other chaste? Yeah. I mean, single so chaste, men. Be, chaste men, chaste women. I mean, even like, so for me, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm like, and I said, you know, shouldn't that be my decision though? 
I mean, if I want to hang out with you and your friends, I love kids. I just don't feel called to have them. But shouldn't that be my decision whether I want to hang out with you and your wife and six kids or five kids or whatever? Shouldn't I be able to make the decision? And you say, well, I just don't want you to feel uncomfortable. Well, I don't feel uncomfortable. You, you, you know, I don't really care. You know, so I think that, um, I think that's the only thing that I would say that has kind of really kind of bothered me is we say that, yes, you can live a chaste life, but then you're like, well, have fun doing it by yourself somewhat. Um, but I think that's the only thing I do miss about the Protestant church is that we did ha have groups. Um, and coming to the church again and moving um, back, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back and forth. No, that's fine. Yeah. 2015, I came to the church. Well, I had to move back home July of 2016. Um, so I'd been in the church a year before I moved back home. My grandmother got really sick. Um, she actually was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension in January. I moved home in July. And she died in August. Um, so I've been here since 2016 and kind of, I don't want <clears throat> to, kind of fell away. That's because I got so depressed and so upset. And there was no, there's really not a huge Catholic. It is in Atlanta where I live now, but where I was at, there's only one Catholic church and it was very, for me, I felt it wasn't for something for me. Uh, for you know, it had they. I think they played. It was more than nineteen sixties hymns. And I'm like, first of all, let's not bring out the guitars. I mean, I don't mind them. I don't care. But I'm lo I love more the organ. Um, so, kind of so you know, that you found that you're saying in Atlanta, in the well, bigger bigger metropolitan areas. I found that in the bigger metropolitan areas, we have better Catholic churches than we do out where I live. I live in a very rural area. I lived in an hour and a half west of Atlanta. I've since sold my grandmother's house and now moved in, live in Atlanta. Oh, God, got it. Where I'm part of a bigger parish, um, got it. Which, is, which is awesome. But sometimes those, very, those country parishes, where they're needed, they just don't really have a lot or they don't have a lot for younger people. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, so I did. I quit going to church for a while, and then I started going because I didn't like it. I liked Latin because I took Latin in high school. I loved the Latin mass. So I'm trying to get to where I am today. Um, and so I would drive an hour and a half. Now this is probably going to have some people up in arms when I say this, but I actually didn't know anything about the SSPX. So I went there to a parish. I was like, okay, well it's Catholic. I mean, I don't know who they are. Like it was just Latin and I loved, and they loved, they loved Jesus and I love Jesus and it's Catholic. So I'm going to go. So I went there for a year and a half. Well, I talked to my priest and I actually moved there to where I'm at now at St. Catherine's in Kennesaw, uh, Georgia here. Have a great priest. A, it's a great parish, you know, and I'm finally, again, finding where I'm supposed to be at. It, yeah. it took me from 2016 to now. So God has took, had me pretty much in a kind of a desert. Since I came into the church, kind of to study him, and but I've gotten more closer to him. And people ask me why I chose the Catholic Church. All my Protestant friends, I'm like, you know what? I feel closer to Christ now than I've ever felt before. They're like, but Catholics don't read the Bible. I'm like, actually, we read we read more of the Bible than you do. I'm like, every service, our literally starts with our service starts with a passage and ends with a passage, and you can follow the whole Mass biblically it, and i could you know show you and i'm like we actually read an old testament we we pray a psalms we read a new testament we read a gospel i'm like i'm lucky to get a, a verse in your church um so, so it's, it's just repeating what what people have heard <laughs> yeah i'm like really so and they, they just don't they don't have any new arguments they're just rehashing old ones yeah now um, I think about the groups that you talked about that mm -hmm. were that exist on the Protestant side. Mm -hmm. um, are you talking about just any gather? They're just better at gathering folks in well, small groups so that all different ages feel kind of part of a community. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Well, I, actually, I'll go back. To, I think you said it in one of your one of your other videos talking about. A more small, like biblical Bible groups, type like, groups, like Bible study groups Got that it. meet outside of the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, where, you know, we meet, you know, together, 
mass on Sundays or you know Saturday nights, whichever one you go to. But there's really nothing. We can go to daily mass, and that's fine. That's great. Um, but sometimes I think you need to have that study time with other people because the Bible says, you know, tells us that iron sharp for man, iron sharpens iron. Yeah. If we're not meeting together, you know, like I am, I'm actually a brother knight as well. I'm a third degree. So, and we only, I mean, even there, you, they don't get a lot uh, together a lot. So you get together, you know, and I know life is busy, but sometimes I feel like when we do life together, it makes it easier because sure. we're sharing each other's burdens. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one thing that I wish, the, and I'm not saying all Catholic Church, some of them actually do do out group, do do groups. But I think if all of them were to do some kind of groups that they want to meet outside of the church, um, especially during this time of COVID, I mean, you can still do it, do it on Zoom. I mean, it doesn't have to be face-to-face. It's just do it together. Yeah. Sometimes having a study or just having something is what I kind of miss. Um, you know, just because I don't really, like I said, I don't really have a group of friends. So it would just be nice to have, you know, just somebody to sit and chat. And I think that's because a lot of people think that, you know, even in the Catholic Church here in Atlanta, I found out that some people think that a chaste life is kind of old school. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, well, all priests are chaste that aren't married. Yeah. Or, you know, so, and they're like, well, you know, that's them. I'm like, but for you, I'm like, but they, I'm like, doesn't Paul tell us that if it's better to be, to be single, to be all about our father's business, but if we don't, and they don't really have anything to say. They're like, well, that meant divorce people. I'm like, I don't know where you got that from. They're like, because the Bible clearly says you can't divorce. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, chastity. Chastity is a real call. No no question about that. Um, you know, with the group thing, I think it's also a matter of uh, maybe better marketing because, you know, the church has Curcio, the retreat. I don't know if that's in your area. Yeah. This 90 is, is starting to get bigger. I'm part of a group, uh, the Catholic Men's Leadership Alliance, and the platform, if you've heard of it, Heroic Men. So it's good. These resources are starting to get more and more out there. But I do agree with you that there needs to be uh, just a greater push towards that to make sure that people know this is not just um, we're doing this for fun. We want to equip our brothers and I'll just keep focusing on, on men for now. Of course, it could be uh, with women as well. But with, with men, to your point about iron sharpening iron, there's also the accountability that, as cliche as it starts to sound, it's absolutely necessary for so many people that they need to be able to check in <laughs> with people and say, okay, can I be real with you? We can't have groups where we come to the table and continually say, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. So I felt that the groups that I've been in, when people finally start to share the struggles of life, that's when, that's when it all, all the magic happens. So, you know, I'll say that there's a group of guys that we've done things together. Like right now we're actually finishing up the the 54 day Norvina. We've been doing so we finish up on Sunday um, and we use um, signal, the signal app mm-hmm. to, for, for our communication. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's been nice, you know, and, and I think too, for people to say, you know, well, God wants, you know, God doesn't, God wants you to marry or God wants you to be thing. I'm like, well, I can't. I mean, I literally still have my struggles. I struggle every day. And I think that's the cross that God has given me. And, you know, and I, you know, I, I mean, and if it is that I carry it. You know, I have to die to self. I can't, you know, do it. Like I told the priest, I'm like, you know what? I still may be attracted to guys and I still may, you know, may never be not. But as long as I keep my focus on Christ, then I'll be fine. But it's when I turn away um, is when I start to stumble. And I'll tell you another thing, you know, and pornography was huge in my life too. And I'll tell you one thing that's actually got me done and people can say it's not true, but as long as I do my rosary, every morning i'm fine like so i get up at 4 30 every morning and pray my rosary because if i don't do it i can tell a day that i don't do it i have the worst day so that for me has kept me close um and so i you know i'm a huge component of the rosary i mean i didn't understand at first because obviously coming in you know but you know mary was never an issue for me 
I didn't understand why Protestants really didn't see her any higher than what we, you know, as Protestants do see her. Um, but I'm like, because, you know, I clearly saw that Mary was the queen of heaven because you have Bathsheba, which was the queen, you know, which was the queen of, you know. Queen mother. Time. Yeah. The mother. Yeah. And they're like, this not I'm like, well, the queen was not, you know, so, you know, Solomon's wife. It was his mother. And I'm like, if you do it, I'm like, it's just type topology and you're always talking about it. But I have also, you know, learned coming to the church that Protestants will see what they want to see. You know, and I think that's, you know, and I think that's for anybody. So for me, it was very easy for me to come in because I came in saying, you know what, I'm going to come in with, with a very open mind and an open heart. And going back to the begin very beginning, I felt like, you know, when I was called out, that God could have to do it because I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and every way, even though I've stumbled and sometimes fallen, God has still been there to pick me up and to walk with me. Um, I think it's the whole thing about the, you know, the footsteps in the sand. You know, you only, it's usually, you know, it's me and Christ, but you only see one, one footstep because Christ is carrying us. I think that's, that's me. I mean, I look back and I only want to see one foot, set of footprints, but there's two of us. Um, now, you, are there people that, Go ahead, finish your thought. Go ahead. Listen, I, think that, I think that's what people should realize, you know, it's just, to, you know, when things get down to look to Christ, you know, and, you know, and especially go, go to the, the Blessed Mother because she really is there. She's going to do more than people want to think that she does. Have you come across other people that have had this change, this whether God confronted them you know, intervened in some way, or they just naturally felt called to something. Have you come across other people like you that had the lifestyle, they feel radically changed, and yet they still have temptation? Because there are people, because my story is one of coming out of, you know, pornography and things like that, and being called to chastity within marriage and making sure that I'm checking my thoughts, checking mm -hmm. everything, right? But that's not to say you can have the, the conversion, the circumcision of heart and still have temptation. And yet temptation seems to get conflated with, oh, that's still who you are. And so I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I will say the Catholic Church does have a great group called Courage. I, I've not been, and for me, those, and sadly for those groups, they don't really help me. Um, and, you know, because, uh, so I think there are people, I've not met them, um, only because I don't go to those type of groups, only because I feel like it's not like any other, we're not, people still treat this sin like it's the worst sin. Like, with they meet in secret? They don't want people to know. For me, I'm like, you know what? It is what it is. I mean, no, that takes, that takes that's a grace that you're even able to talk about. You're absolutely right. There's, I mean, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, this sin is no more worse. If you look at Corinthians, it's actually in there with you know fornicators, you know homosexuality, you know drunkenness, you know gluttony. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I don't see homosexuality or struggling with that any different than I see in a divorce. I don't see any different. I don't think God sees it any different. And, and for people to still want to have meet in secrets, I think that for me says that I'm ashamed of who I, what I, who I am. And, and again, I, courage is great. That's just how I feel. No, no, no. I, I understand. I mean, my, my again, um, my story is one of you put it out in the light and what can happen in the light is, is phenomenal. That doesn't mean that everyone is called to that. But I think in your case, you're able to naturally talk about this because that's what happened. What, I mean, what are you what are you supposed to do? You, I love it because you're like, OK, I wasn't getting affirmed. Here's what happened. Mm -hmm. It was a struggle during these years. Here's what happened. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, and I think, too, I think there's more guys out there, but sadly, stories like mine don't get out there that you can live with these struggles and be chased and be very fine like i i literally i have three dogs 
you know, and, you know, so, you know, I do that, I live by myself, you know, like, I'm totally normal. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and a lot of people, I think you hear, the stories you hear, or that most people want you to hear is that, oh, well, I changed. And I'm now married to a woman. Well, did you, or did you, did, then, then my question is, is we're, and then I'm actually, then I have to catch myself because I'm not saying they couldn't change. Yeah, of course. My thing is, is they actually had to have an attraction to a female. Of course. Like, like there had to be something there. Yeah. For me, I don't remember even being attracted to females. Uh, like I could tell you a female is beautiful all day long. I mean, I don't, I see, I mean, beauty, like I think people is God's artwork. And I, you know, I think women, you know, I think women are most beautiful though when they don't wear makeup and when they're modest. That's my idea of that. And, and so I can tell a beautiful woman. Sure. I just am not attracted to them. Sure. Um, and I think that those that are able to maybe marry a female had some kind of inclination within them. Sure. Now, does that mean that God made a mistake? No. He made me, he knew that what I was going to do. And he, you know, and this was the cross that he gave me. And he's, I, and, and he's using it. Right. And you know what? I can't, I can't, I couldn't carry your cross. You know, because it wasn't made for me. It, you know, your cross wasn't for me. My cross wasn't for you. We, we have our own crosses because God has given us our cross because that's the cross he wants us to carry. Yeah. You know, and, and I tell people like, you know what? We don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. This is my thorn in the flesh. But, and they're like, well, Paul was, again, I'm like, I never said he was. I just said he had a thorn in the flesh. I'm like, actually, Paul probably had an issue with females because of where he was at the time. We don't know. You know I'm like, I can assume. I mean, he may... He might like gambling. I don't know. I mean, so yeah, um, the, the 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 core of that message is no matter what it is, we can you we can, can all relate. <laughs> yeah, we can relate. And as you cry out to God, He reminds you that His grace is sufficient, and that's it. And you can't necessarily explain why you deal with certain things. And sometimes you feel like you're going insane, and yet only you know if God is calling you to that. To, perse no. to, to persevere through that is what I'm trying to say. And I think too, like, I'm, not, I'm not too prideful to say that. I think this is the only way God knew that he keep me closer to him because I don't really struggle with anything else. Like, I don't drink, I don't gamble. I mean, I just, I mean, so I think this was the only way that he knew that I would be closer to him because I had to rely on him every day. I, like every morning I get up, I'm like, you know what, God, I'm, I'm here. Let's see how this day goes. Um, but you know, and, I, and going back, to, I think though, I think there are more people out there like me. I just mm -hmm. think they, they, they don't know how to keep going. I think that they don't really have, like myself, we don't really have a group, like, cause I'm not accepted. And by that mean, I mean, I don't, I'm not accepted by heterosexuals. I'm not accepted by the gay community because they're like, I'm like, so I have my own community, you know? I go to, to, for corporate worship, but people, you know, guys feel uncomfortable when they hang around me. I'm like, and, you know, and, and I just look at them like, you do realize that men have taste too, right? And, you know, and I'm like, so. But, but, but yeah, no, that's funny. That's pretty illogical when you think through it, because if a man says, yeah, I'm attracted to women, but I'm, that's the end of it, right? Yeah. If, if a woman hears that, they're going to, I don't know how many are going to be like, I can't be. Right near this guy you know so yeah. it's guys are like, well, good go ahead go ahead so the, and the guys are just like well you know i just don't want you looking at me i'm like I, I, have i given you the thing that i have i'm like i'm like you know and i tell you when people just, and my friends just laugh at me i'm like look i have taste and my taste is very expensive so unless you're making six figures then you're probably not even in my ball range and all my friends are like, really? And you know, and I say that just to make, make people joke. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because I, most of these people that I hang around with aren't making six figures a year. Um, but, um, <laughs> but it's, but it, you know, and so. But you're bringing up a good point and I don't have the answer to it, but that's, it's real. You know, the church does talk about it, SSA, right? right. Um, on one side, you feel like you can't find your tribe right. and on the other side you can't fully find your tribe right and i don't know that the answer is um a separate tribe i feel that the answer is more and more people 
that can understand that your past or whatever you actively deal with is not who you are and it's nothing to be in fact that's the call of the christian to to be able to help a friend and the only way you can help a friend is to realize that you have your own stuff right that you may you know everyone has different temptations different sins etc and to judge one differently like you nailed it with the verse about those that will not inherit the kingdom of god mm -hmm. you know um you could be someone that is actively engaged in one of those areas and you're just hounding someone that just sins differently they're in a different category which can lead to the ultimate in pride where you think that you have it all together but anyway in in my story and maybe in yours you know when you finally open up about some of these things you are humbled and and while you're in that place that maybe you've never been before you can then start to fathom how much pride you do have but until you actually say this is where I, this is where I messed up. And these are the areas where I need help. You know what I mean? But I think there's also, we look at it, we look at my, our struggles and we look at how even the church, even today, I had this talk with my priest. I was like, look, I don't, I left the Protestant church because I felt the Catholic church was fighting, you know, same-sex attraction or, you know, homosexuality rape. But then I'm like, we look at people like what do we, we look at the scandals that's been rocking the church okay um then we look at you know father james martin and he doesn't and he makes me people like me and struggle people's like well you know father james says it's okay well but the catholic church teaches in the catechism of the catholic church that it is inherently wrong and not natural now i can't help what father you know martin does that's between him and the Lord. All I can do is follow the teachings of the church. You know, and, and you look back and, you know, I watched one of your um, videos. I watched one of your videos. I went to the, what was that? The, it was the church fathers that you gave out that has. Oh, churchfathers.org? Yes. Because I went to there and started reading and you look at St. Um, Justin Martyr talks about it. You also see that St. You know, Augustine was talking about it. Yeah. So you obviously know that this was having an issue in the first century. So, you, you know, it's not something that people, you know, it's not, and I tell people, like, it's not like God woke up one morning and said, oh my gosh, men are attracted to men. So it didn't catch God off guard because we yeah. see it in the Old Testament. Um, but I think it, you know, I think we do a disservice too sometimes when we tell people they're going to hell. And this is always done to me. You tell people you're going to hell, but you don't have to tell them how to keep from going to hell. It, it, man, you nailed it. There, you're, describing two, you're describing two ends of that spectrum. One is come as you are, stay as you are. Mm -hmm. And the other is you're going to hell. Right. Is the, you're, you're right in that spot where, where's the courage to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. Even when you don't understand, you know, some inclinations or, or tendencies, yeah. things like that. Go ahead. Well, I consider myself, I tell myself that I'm a modern day eunuch because I feel chased. And if we look, we, if we remember that the eunuch usually if in no Testament times and in, in no times was actually, most of them were castrated, but you can actually do a spiritual, they you can be, you know, Christ yeah. has us, our soul ones that choose to be. That's right. And they usually were those that protected the queen. They were there to be with the queen and stand by the queen and to, you know, and that's how I consider myself um, is that I am there to protect our queen. And that is how I live every day. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how, because I'd love to have more people hear that, because I think that if, my question is, I said, what if those of those people who are actually homosexual or lesbian or whatever, transgender, whatever you want to say, what if they were actually modern day eunuchs and actually were supposed to be there to pray the rosary and be all about to protect the queen and pray to the queen and talk to her? What if they were to do that than what they're supposed to do? You, you, you know, because, you know, a lot of them, I'm like, you know, a lot of people, but the world doesn't say that. And I think that I am probably one that's weird because I don't listen to the world. Like, I don't watch TV. I literally watch YouTube. 
I found, you know, when how I found your channel, I say that is how I found your channels. I was looking for, I, I, I typed in Catholic men because <laughs> I really wanted to hear from Catholic men how to be a Catholic man. Sure. Your, yours was one of the first ones that came up. Other ones came up, but yours was one of the first ones. And I started watching you, um, you know, so because I really wanted to get in, in depth and how a Catholic man is to act and um, in a Catholic family. So looking at that, I was like, okay, God, this is how I'm going to do it. I feel like if you're calling me to that, then I'm going to protect our queen. I'm going to pray to her. I'm going to talk to her. I'm going to do what I have to. Um, but a lot of people don't see that. And a lot of people won't want to see that. Um, sure. And you know what? I think that's um, where, you, you know, I have to, you know, say, look, well, this is what I'm going to do. Like, I don't, literally, I don't have cable. I haven't had cable in six years. I think cable is just, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten to where there's nothing on it. It's, you know, because I was, I'm 42. So what I'm used to, you know, what I, shows I would watch, I, they're not there. I mean, I like wholesome. I like really old shows. Like I love older shows because it's not, I don't, I'm not all about sex. I hate turning on TV and it just be about sex. I'm like, really? Like I, that made it two minutes and 45 seconds. Let's, you know, so, you know, and I think that's, you know, the whole thing is like, I, I have a room, I turn it off, I read, I watch YouTube, I, you know, listen to podcasts and, you know, if it's okay, I may transition to talk about the school and how I found Judah Catholic. Yeah, if you can, we've got, if you could sum it up in like two, three minutes. Yeah, I can. Awesome. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. So basically, I work for a school called Out School. It's actually for homeschoolers or for kids around the world who want to get a school, but it was getting very worldly. I was told that I had to teach LGBT stuff within the, in my classes, and I refused, um, but started praying and founded Judah Catholic Academy. Now, what Judah Catholic Academy is, is we are a resource for homeschoolers, for parents to come. We have classes, so we have educators that are either going to teach you live classes or on-demand classes. They will, and they adhere specifically to the Catholic faith. I do not let anything go up on my website that does not specifically have Catholic faith, the Catholic faith into it. Like, unless it's a math and I'm not, you know, math, I don't know how you do that Catholicly, but you know, but <laughs> one, um, <laughs> one plus one plus one equals one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's that way. And then, you know, and so we're teaching, like I'm teaching philosophy. We're doing it classical. We're either doing it tra classical, traditional um, style. Again, it's just, we're doing top-notch educators. Like they have to have, know what they're doing um, to homeschool kids um, who maybe their parents can't teach them or don't understand. Or maybe, you know, some kids just don't learn from their parents. They're just not going to listen no matter what you do um and you could come there and you know again you know get our videos or you know sign up for a live class you know i'm teaching i teach philosophy classes i'm teaching government classes my master's is in government is in government so i teach a lot of the government and history uh, we do not teach anything about you know black lives matter crt i'm teaching kids something that they're going to need to go out you know when they when they leave judah or they leave homeschool i want them to be able to get a job you know you know, and I'm also going to be doing some adult classes, and I'm going to be talking a lot about, I'm actually going to do a class on the delusion and the gay theology of the gay gospels for parents, uh, because I don't want, because that's the whole thing is we don't have education. A lot of parents don't understand. A lot of people just think, you know, a lot of people, if they watch, you know, gay shows or whatever, they just think it's funny, but their parents don't understand this and then doctor it. Um, and so really, you know, Judah Catholic Academy is for that you know, Catholic teachings, you're not going to get anything. I mean, you're going to get all Catholic teachings, like anything, like I have, I don't know if you've ever heard of um, Dr. Paul Thigpen. I've heard that name. I don't know where. He's, he's actually, he's, uh, I don't know if I call it. he's probably a theologian. He writes a lot of books. Okay. Maybe that's he actually, he goes to my parish. So he's actually my, he's actually the person we go to for theolo theological questions. So if I have a question or the co-founder, we're, we're both converts. Um, if we have a question, we send it to him and he says yes or no. Excellent. Um, you know, and so I think that is one thing that I wanted our Catholic kids, I wanted Catholic parents to be able to have somewhere to go for Catholic kids to have their faith yeah. and not get taught, you know, because sadly in our Catholic private schools, they're not really teaching, you know, some schools aren't teaching the faith. I'm not saying all of them, but there are some that aren't. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, bound to. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, so I think that's, you know, all about Judah and feel free, you know, look it up. It's at, uh, it's judahcatholic.com. Um, you know, feel free to, you know, look that up or if you have any questions, you know, if I can give you my information, if they need to call or they need to email me. I yeah, can I'll, I'll include all of it in the description. If you think of any other links it just send them to me and I'll make sure I put them in there. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I shoot, man. I could talk to you for another hour, but we're gonna have to. <laughs> to cut the, thank you, thank you for reaching out. Thank you for your courage. Keep doing what you're doing. What you said about the protecting the mother, absolutely brilliant. Brought tears to my eyes. Um, so just keep doing what you're doing, and um, God bless you, and everything related to the homeschool environment as well as like you were talking about finding those those groups we got to keep keep that moving along in the catholic faith so anyway uh with that everyone thank you for watching until next time take care and god bless bye